Hi, I'm Dr. Stan DeCoven, and this is the Walk in Wisdom program. Walk in Wisdom is based upon one scripture in Colossians chapter 4, verse 5, which simply says that uh, we're to learn to walk in the wisdom of God, both with people in the church or in the community of faith and those on the outside. And uh, this program is designed really to try and give some practical teaching, some practical theology, to help you to grow in your relationship with the Lord and with each other in the body of Christ and the community at large. Hey, today we're going to be talking about uh, what I simply call the goal of our instruction. And this is based upon a passage of scripture in 1 Timothy. It's really a, a personal letter from Paul, the, the great apostle, to Timothy, a younger apostle, who was now in Ephesus by request of Paul overseeing a great church at that day and time. So let me just read the passage of scripture to you. Uh, again, if I'm reading from the New International Version. <clears throat> Some call it the nearly inspired version, the Northern Ireland version, all kinds of versions. But anyway, it reads well enough uh, to be able to give us the gist of what Paul's concern was and what he was trying to say to his son and the Lord Timothy. So from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. These promote controversies rather than God's work, which is by faith. For the goal of this command, or the goal of our instruction, it says in the New American Standard Version, is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Well, this letter from Paul, which is this just the beginning of it, was a very personal letter to his son in the Lord Timothy. What an interesting relationship they had. If you think back and read through the scriptures a bit, you realize that uh, their relationship began when Timothy was very, very young. Paul was traveling in ministry. He met his family. His, uh, Timothy's mother was, was Jewish. His father was Greek. Therefore, he had never been circumcised, which was necessary to, to really work amongst the Jewish people. And Timothy was one who apparently loved Paul and trusted him enough that he was willing to go through the rite of circumcision. And then they traveled together for a long time, where Timothy would have been basically Paul's helper. He served him. Probably would have helped him in the uh, business that Paul had, uh, doing um, you know, various bits of work with leather and all of that. And uh, wherever Paul went, Timothy went. If Paul ended up in prison, well, guess where Timothy went? He, took, he went with him and took care of him. Well, in, the, in, in time, Timothy obviously would have grown. He would have learned to maybe preach like Paul preached, teach like Paul preached, think like Paul thought because of the time that they had spent together. And so Paul must have thought it was time for Timothy now to step up into a higher level of leadership. So when Paul heard that the church in Ephesus, which again, he didn't found, it was founded by Apollos, but he really helped set the foundation of it. You can read about that in Acts chapter 19. Uh, he'd heard that it was growing and it really needed two things. It, it needed stronger leadership, which Timothy could provide, but it also needed someone that knew theology well enough to bring correction to problems that were happening within the church. And as we know, you know, every local church has people in it, and where there's people, there's problems. And so naturally, there would have been some correction that needed to be made, and Timothy was just the young man that Paul trusted to send on that assignment. Now, when he went, or probably before Timothy left, he and Paul would have had long conversations about what the job was going to be like, what the people were like, what the city was like, and what the goals or the purpose for Timothy's time there would would be and so now here it is several months perhaps years later and Paul recognizes I haven't heard much from Timothy I don't really know what's going on but I have received some reports about some issues and problems I think I'm going to sit down and I'm going to dictate a letter which a scribe would then write for Paul 
And I'm going to send this off to my son in the Lord, Timothy. Now, when he did that, I, I will guarantee you, it wasn't just off the top of Paul's head. No, he would have taken time to think through. I, I assume he spent quite a bit of time in prayer, asking the Holy Spirit for guidance on, on what to say, how to say it. I mean, so much so that it became inspired literature. It became part of the Bible. It became God's word for Timothy, written to Timothy, but written also for us even today. So Paul, in dictating that, he would have been thinking specifically about Timothy, about this incredible young man that he loved so much, and he would have wanted to share his heart and to share strategy and, and all the things that would be necessary because Paul's greatest concern for Timothy was that he'd be successful in the calling that he had in the kingdom of God. So he would have written it and he sealed it with his own seal and sent a courier who took off running to deliver this letter to Timothy, bishop, apostle in Ephesus. Now when the letter arrived, I would assume that you know, Timothy was probably busy. I mean, the church was really expanding in Ephesus. It had lots of people. Uh, churches were meeting in houses and homes. And so they were probably scattered all over the city, all over the region. And Timothy's responsibility was kind of pastoring the pastors more than pastoring the churches. Which, if you've ever done something like that, I mean, pastoring pastors is kind of like herding cats. I mean, it's not always the easiest thing to do because they all are strong, they're leaders, they have their own opinions, etc. But that was Timothy's primary responsibility. Now, the day that he got the letter, I don't know what he was doing. He was probably busy taking care of problems, issues, whatever. But at the moment he would have gotten this letter and seen the seal of Paul, I guarantee you, whatever was going on that day, it was canceled. This was from Paul. This wasn't just a piece of junk mail. This was not something from even the Roman Empire uh, or Caesar. He could care less about that. But from Paul, his father in the faith, there was nothing more important for Timothy to do that day but then to carefully open that letter, to find a place that was quiet and isolated where he could sit down and read every word of that letter. And as he read it, of course, he would have had in his mind, in his heart, in his spirit, the voice of Paul. He knew the heart of Paul. He knew Paul's intentions for him. He know, knew the affection that Paul had for him and the affection he had for Paul. And so all of that would have been a part of what was going on in Timothy as he sat down to read this letter. This letter was written primarily to remind Timothy of things that they had already previously discussed. I don't think any of this information was new to Timothy, but it was probably wonderful for him to get the reinforcement from his spiritual father that, first of all, he loved him, secondly, that he was full of grace, third, that he was with him, and fourth, listen, I, I want to help you to be successful in your journey in God. You know, wouldn't it be nice, honestly, if we, as God's people, treated the Word of God as well as Timothy would have treated that letter? I mean, when you think about it, isn't the entire Bible a love story from God to us? It tells from beginning to end all that the Father has done for us, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I mean, the wonderful dance, if you will, of the Trinity is expressed throughout the Word of God. And we, as God's people, have been invited into this relationship through Christ. And so... Even as Timothy, when we sit down and read the Word, shouldn't we, I don't, it's, there's nothing magical in the book, it's just a book, it's got paper, it's got ink, but the words are the very words of God for us. I mean, I remember back as a young man, I was saved when I was 12 from a life of sin and degradation. Okay, I really didn't know what sin was, I, I couldn't even spell degradation, but anyway, I learned about those things later. But I remember my pastor, Lee Speakman, he, he told me right up front, he said, listen, if you want to grow in God, and of course I wanted to, doesn't everybody? I wanted to grow. He said, you, there's four things you need to do. These are the big pillars. Number one, read the Bible every day. In fact, if you can, read it three times a day. Pray every day. In fact, if you can, pray three times a day, just like Daniel did. Fellowship. He didn't say fellowship three times a day, thank goodness, because we went to church almost every day anyway. 
And to me, fellowship meant potlucks, which I really enjoyed. And the fourth was then witness, share your faith. Those are the things that will help you to grow. Well, so trying to be as faithful as possible and basically being obsessive compulsive by nature, I tried to do everything my pastor said. So I'd read the Bible morning, even at lunchtime, I carried a little Gideon Bible with me, even in high school. So I was a bit of a nerd in some ways, but also an athlete. Anyway, but I, you know, I'd read the Bible at lunchtime. I'd read it at night. And I didn't always understand what I read. And I, all, I didn't always take it seriously. I mean, I, I, I wish now, looking back, I would have taken it sometimes a bit more seriously. And especially from the perspective that God, from eternity past to eternity present to eternity future has placed into my hands this wonderful book that speaks life to me it speaks life to you and it's transformative by God's grace well anyway so this letter written to Timothy I just want to cover a few small points in in today's session regarding this wonderful, wonderful passage of Scripture. So remember, Paul said, first of all, I, I, you know, don't deal with all this controversial nonsense. Don't, deal, don't worry about people that are telling stories and myths. This was mainly the Judaizers that had come through Ephesus and kept telling the disciples there, well, you have to get circumcised, you have to wear a prayer shawl, you have to do temple worship, you have all these things that you have to do. Now, for the Gentiles, we know that's just absolutely unnecessary and so uh, Timothy had to deal with that kind of stuff so he said don't don't worry so much about that just preach the gospel of the kingdom that's what it's all about and don't forget the key goals of why you're there and why you teach you know I, I, I work with a lot of pastors a lot of leaders and one of the things I tell them is that when whenever you're going to speak you're going to preach you're going to teach you need to kind of have your audience in mind Number one. Number two, you need to know what are you trying to accomplish because there should be something accomplished besides the fact that you finish a message and maybe get a paycheck. Uh, there, there, there should be something that's really accomplished when you speak. That should be the goal. It should be the goal of your heart. It should be the goal of, of your preparation before you ever preach or teach. Well, Paul, again, reminding Timothy, says, remember, the goal of our instruction. Now, I love the fact that he said our. Because, you know, whatever Timothy was teaching, he would have learned it from Paul. And so Paul recognized that Timothy's teaching was an extension of his teaching, which was an extension of Christ's teaching, which is an extension for all of us from the Word of God. There's nothing new under the sun. I mean, we may present a message in more clever ways now than perhaps in times past, but... Nonetheless, it's the Word of God that speaks, and it's the Word of God that changes people. So he's, he's reminding him, listen, here's the goal of our teaching. The reason we teach, it's so important that you stay focused on this, Timothy. And first of all, it's love. Now, now you know, after I was saved, I was raised in an evangelical Methodist church. Great church, good Bible-believing church, a small denomination here in, in the United States. It was, it was good. Got a good foundation in faith. When I was about 17 years of age, I had a real hunger for, I guess you would say, more of the Holy Spirit. Everyone was talking about the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. So out of my hunger, I eventually had a wonderful experience with the Holy Spirit. You know, it didn't really fit with the doctrine of my evangelical Methodist church. So I ended up leaving there and going to a full gospel church. I'm not sure what that means, full gospel, but anyway, they at least believe in the infilling of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit as present expressions for today. Now, I, I remember that when I received that wonderful experience from the Lord, uh, I went to then this full gospel church, and they began to teach that, you know, if you're going to be really uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, you've got to live a holy life. Well, okay, I, I want to live a holy life. So what is a holy life? He says, well, it's don't smoke and don't chew and don't go with girls who do, kind of. I mean, it was more the external. It's what you wore, it's how you talked, it's where you went, it's who you had relationship with in terms of friendship. I mean, we couldn't, we couldn't go to a movie, we couldn't dance, we couldn't, um, I mean, we just couldn't. If it was fun, God's not in it. 
Well, I think most of us know that that's not what the Bible teaches, of course, but that's what my church taught. And so I kind of thought that, man, if you're going to grow in God, you've got to get the outside taken care of first. And then maybe in time you take care of the inside. Well, here it's interesting the order in which Paul puts this teaching, the goal, the purpose. And really the overall goal, as we'll look at in a minute, is transformation. It's change. So he says the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart. Now the word love there is the word agape. He could have used one of the four primary Greek words for love, storge, phileo, eros, agape, but he chose agape because it was a God-like love where the orientation of one's life, one's thoughts, feelings, and actions, instead of being self-focused, which is the typical life of a individual that is outside of the kingdom of God, uh, the focus would be other-oriented and God-oriented. So love, which comes because our heart has been purified. Now, how did our heart get purified? Well, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. We're made righteous by the blood of Jesus. Well, that's a great thing. So what Paul is simply saying is, listen, every time you teach, what you want is for some sort of additional, if you will, cleansing. Some, something that's going to make people feel fresh and clean and pure uh, in their relationship with God and with others. In other words, change needs to start from the inside and then it works its way out. So love from a pure heart. So it's the change of heart that's most important. And the number one goal of our teaching is to see hearts change. So in practical terms, for instance, if you're dealing with a husband and wife and you have a husband who's a bit of a Cro-Magnon man, uh, who has no ability really to, to love other than what I get from the relationship, well, a true transformation, love from a pure heart, would be that his heart changes in terms of his orientation toward God and toward his wife. He begins to see her not as an object, but as a person created in the image of God, deserving of God's love and grace, and begins to treat her in such a way. Be a remarkable transformation, wouldn't it? And it's what God intends in the lives of all of his people. So love from a pure heart, purified. The word heart there is cardia, the center of a person's being change. Then it says, and a good conscience. Now the word there, good, means essentially God-like. Well, what's a God conscience? What is God conscious of? Now the word conscious there is a word for the co-perception. And one of the aspects of God's ability, which is certainly different in many ways than ours, although progressively I believe we should think more and more like God, is that he's able to take in the whole span of reality both good and bad in a glance, all at the same time. He has complete perception. So even though things aren't always good or always seemingly going right, he still sees both the good and the bad in the same glance. A God-like perception is a person who has the, a renewed mind. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, the scripture says, I urge you, brothers sisters by the mercy of God because of God's mercy that you present your body a living sacrifice and there's part of your worship uh, a living sacrifice which is holy it's set aside to God it's reasonable makes perfect sense uh, holy and acceptable to God and it's your reasonable duty of service if you will or worship and don't be conformed to this world but be metamorphosis transformed by the renewing of your mind then you'll know what is a good and acceptable perfect will of God well so Paul thinking of this with Timothy, realizes that that change that happens is a renewing of the mind where we begin to see things the way God sees things. So instead of seeing people the way that we may have been raised within our culture or seeing uh, governments or seeing uh, you know, circumstances, for, for instance, I mean, this is a strange one for a lot of believers, but it's, it's none, none the case true. Uh, people do get sick. You may have noticed that. People get sick, but by his stripes, we not just are healed, but we were healed. Well, wait a minute, but I'm sick. 
How can I be healed? Or I'm not healed. I'm not walking in health. But in God, he can see both at the same time. Yes, it is true. Sickness, disease exist in the world. But I have made provision for that through Christ. And true faith is recognized. Not denying that there's sickness. That's kind of silly. It does exist. But it's affirming that in spite of what's happened in the world because of sin, Christ is triumphant and we are more than conquerors through Christ. We are victorious in Him. So a renewed mind, we begin to think differently, see things differently, more and more God-like in our thoughts. So, the goal of our instructions, love. Remember, starts from the inside, if you will, the heart, then the mind our thinking, so that our perception is lined up similar to the way God would have it. Now, are we ever going to get there perfectly? Probably not, but we move progressively in that direction. And the third thing is a sincere faith. Now, what does that mean? Well, literally there, pistis, the word faith there, it means to be faithful. It means to believe completely that God is good. And in other words, it's speaking about one's behavior or actions. A faithful person how do you know if they're faithful? Well, they faithfully do what they've committed to do over time. How if you know someone is faithful in their relationship? Well, they never stray from that relationship. How do you know if they're faithful in their relationship with God? Well, in terms of their time, their talent, their treasure, they're good stewards. They're faithful over everything God has given to them. So when it comes time to give, they give with a generous heart because they know that that's a part of their responsibility, but it's also part of their privilege as men and women in the body of Christ. So the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith, a faithful faith. So what was Paul talking about? Well, he's talking about, Timothy, listen, when you preach, when you teach, the goal of your preaching, the goal of your teaching is to see change come. It's transformation. Transformation is internal from the heart first you want to make sure that people's affections are affected by your teaching and that's why I think sometimes stories that we tell including failures we may have experienced help people to connect in the heart they know that we're people as well they know that that though we've all made mistakes all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God that nonetheless that we recognize that because of God's goodness, because of God's grace, we can be everything that God intended for us to be. So our heart, though, must be changed in terms of its orientation. Instead of on self, it's on God first. Love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, strength, which none of us have done perfectly. I mean, I don't think in any given day have I perfectly loved God in thought and in action I mean, I, I try, I hope, but we miss the mark. But he recognizes that. That's why he provides grace for us. Love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That love of God which has been written on our heart, it says in Jeremiah. And then love your neighbor as yourself, which is the outworking of the love of God within us. How do you know someone loves God? Well, because of how they love others. That's the only way you can really demonstrate the reality of that. Then a good conscience, a renewed mind. I mean, Paul was concerned about the way people think. It's still amazing to me how many people in the body of Christ struggle with issues of politics and especially politics in the church and how they, uh, I mean, Christians can argue so vehemently and yet we're brothers and sisters in Christ and we're going to be here together for eternity. Come on. I mean, we need to be able to have the mind of Christ, to see things the way God sees us. You know, presidents come, presidents go. Sometimes we thank God when they come. Sometimes we thank God when they go. But Jesus is still Lord. He's king, and we are ruling with him. And remember, God is concerned about our behavior. He wants us to act as though we truly are believers. That's why I love Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. It says, because you're holy... Because you're chosen, because you're beloved, put on love, put on compassion, put on peace, put on hope, put on Jesus. In other words, walk it out and act it. So Paul's concern was to bring some correction to the church there in Ephesus. It needed some correction. And the correction that he wanted to bring, though, was not to focus on confronting people, but just 
teach what needs to be taught so when people catch what needs to be caught it will change them from the inside out uh, listen this is wisdom this is the wisdom of God when you preach when you teach as you live when you talk to your children when you speak to your spouse the goal of your communication should be that things get better there should be a change of heart. We should be more in love with God and more in love with our brothers and sisters and more in love with the world today than we ever have been in the past because we are pressing in each day to God. The, the goal should be to have a renewed mind, to see things the way God sees them. I mean, you know, God's perspective is perfect. He's got not just a 35,000 foot view of things. He's got the million you know, foot view. He sees it all. We can only see a certain part. We only look through the glass darkly. But nonetheless, as we grow in God, we can see things more clearly. And when we see things more clearly, we can speak more clearly the very mind of God, which is life transforming for God's people. And then, you know, last is, our behavior, our actions. We need to make sure that we're consistent, of course, in our life. A life of wisdom is a life that's not boring, it's exciting, but it's a life that's consistent. It's, we're not hypocrites. Now again, have any of us been? Have I been? Of course we have. We've all again missed the mark, but by God's grace, day by day, as we read the word, as we study, as we pray, as we fellowship, as we share the life of God together, our heart and our mind and our actions will begin to change which will bring greater and greater glory to God. Well I hope this has been helpful for you. Again this is the Walk in Wisdom program. It's sponsored by Vision International a Training and Education Network and Vision International University. We're located in, in the Southern California area but our focus of ministry is all over the world. If you want to get more information, there's some information available to you on your screen. But we really would love to communicate with you and share more about what we call this life of wisdom or the walk in wisdom of God. So again, this is Dr. Stan DeCoven. It's my privilege to be with you, and I'm looking forward to spending more time with you in the future as together we learn to walk in the wisdom of God. God bless you.